Hello everyone, my name is JJ. What do you think of my new hair color? Hopefully it is not too distracting because today we are going to talk about something very serious and important, which is official bilingualism in Canada, which is to say the equal legal status given to French and English. So when a politician does something controversial, that generally means one of two things. Either he did something that offended a large group of ordinary people, or he did something that offended a very small group of of very powerful people. In Canada, there is no group smaller and more powerful than the Canadians who speak French. And last week, Ontario's Premier Doug Ford offended them by making two very controversial decisions. One, he halted the planned construction of a French language university in downtown Toronto. And two, he abolished the office of French language commissioner, which is this department in the Ontario provincial government that people can complain to if they feel the province is not offering adequate French language services. When Ford did these two things, everyone went bananas. Not everyone, in fact, a rather small group of people, Canada's French-speaking elite. This included the leaders of all of the national political parties, the Parliament of Quebec, which passed a unanimous motion denouncing Ford, numerous newspapers, and a vast parade of Canadian academics and activists who are in the business of French language advocacy. Now let us take a step back and look at some numbers. I think that when you talk about French and English in Canada, a lot of the hard numbers tend to get lost in the conversation. In fact, I would say that when you talk about French and English in Canada, you're very explicitly not supposed to talk about numbers because the numbers really conflict with like the mythology. So according to the most recent Canadian census, 17.9% of Canadians claim to be fluent in both French and English. 68.3% of Canadians only know English, while 11. 9% of Canadians only know French. But in some ways, these national numbers can be somewhat deceptive because French-speaking Canadians are not sprinkled evenly across the country. In the province of Quebec, 50% of all residents claim to only be able to speak French, while 44.5% of Quebecers claim to be able to speak French and English. These numbers are like way, way, way out of whack with the reality in the rest of Canada, which really goes a way of showing to the degree that Quebec is this very distinctive place that is very far removed from the Canadian norm. Once we crunch some of the other numbers, we see that 57.7% of all bilingual Canadians are in fact Quebecers. And keep in mind that Quebec as a province only occupies 23% of the Canadian population. So Quebecers are very overrepresented when it comes to possessing this very unique skill. Now, originally, accommodating the distinctive nature of Quebec was the whole reason why Canada introduced the concept of official bilingualism in the 1960s, why English and French were declared the official languages of Canada. There was a sense that the French Canadians had been excluded from the mainstream of Canadian life for far too long and faced very high barriers to public participation because of their language. This seems somewhat quaint today, but you know, back in the day when Canada was a much whiter country than it is now, the rights of the French Canadian minority was was considered like the big social justice issue of its time. Quebec was a much poorer place than the rest of Canada, and the French Canadians were considered almost like a sort of underclass. Someone of like my grandmother's generation would have grown up thinking of the French Canadians as these very poor backwards people that worked all of the worst sorts of jobs, partially because they were less educated, but also partially because they were so bad at English, no one wanted to hire them. There's even this very famous book about French Canadians from the 1960s that compares them to like the African Americans in the US. It is called the, uh, well, I'm just gonna hold my finger over part of the word here but you can probably tell what's going on. So yes, that was certainly how a lot of the French Canadians thought of themselves and how a lot of English Canadians would have thought of them. Anyway, in 1968, the Canadian government passed official bilingualism in order to make it easier for the French Canadians to communicate with their government and get access to government services and so on. Well, I'm quite sure that uh, it will have a solidifying effect on Canadian unity. From the French Canadian side, they will have been given the first concrete proof that uh, Canada and Canadians are just not a host of good intentions, but that we really mean to get down to business when we talk about the two official languages. Uh, the statute will provide equality of the two languages in all areas where the citizens of Canada have to communicate with the government, with Parliament, so that a 
any citizen of Canada will be able to use the official language of his choice. Today, Ottawa provides every government form and website in French as well as English. There are also lots of French-speaking call centers and French-speaking clerks at government offices and all of this sort of thing. I think a lot of English Canadians would argue that this is a perfectly fair and reasonable way for the government of Canada to interact with French-speaking communities. However, what is decidedly not reasonable and fair is what has mutated out of this in the decades since 1968, which is to say the rise of a French-speaking elite. This was actually something that Canada's Conservative Party warned about at the time. We indicated that our party will support the resolution, but we've asked that uh, the problems of the unilingual Canadians in the government service be kept in mind, and we always also cautioned the government about against uh, creating a, a new injustice by uh, not considering adequately in the administration of the Act the fact that French is rather difficult to learn in most English-speaking parts of the country. All right, so this is basically the crux of the problem. Once the Canadian government commits to providing lots of French language services, the Canadian government has to hire lots of French-speaking bureaucrats to run all of the French language services. And then, as the Canadian government grows larger and larger and starts providing more and more services, Ottawa needs to hire even more French language bureaucrats and give them even more power. This includes making all of the senior managers of the government bilingual in order for them to be able to manage all of the bilingual bureaucrats below them. And then you get people arguing that the politicians themselves should also be bilingual, because, of course, it is the role of the politicians to manage the bureaucracy. And this is basically where we are in Canada today. Overall, 43% of all bureaucratic jobs in the Canadian federal government now require the employee to be bilingual. And remember, only 18% of Canadians are bilingual. The bilingual requirements, in turn, get stricter and stricter the higher up the ladder you go. To be head of a bureaucratic department, or to be head of anything important in, like, the judiciary, or the military, or like the finance department, bilingualism is mandatory. And of course, to be a top politician, like prime minister or a senior cabinet minister, bilingualism is required as well. This is all very excessive. It is really quite absurd, in fact, to argue that in order to service the needs of the 11.9% of Canadians who can only speak French, it is somehow necessary for every single figure of importance in the Canadian federal government to be fluent in French. I mean, there are such things as translators. So if this system is so ridiculous, why do we keep it? Basically because it is in the interests of two groups of people in Canadian society that we do keep it. One is the Quebecers, who have gone from being some of the least important people in Canada to the most important people in Canada in a very short period of time. Since Quebecers are the group of Canadians who are most likely to be bilingual, they will naturally benefit disproportionately from any political system that is based around favoring bilingualism. The government currently estimates that 32% of all senior rank bureaucrats in the Canadian federal government are native French speakers. And considering that 85% of all native French speakers are also Quebecers, you can see how they would make out well in this arrangement. The other group that has benefited enormously from this political setup is the small minority of French-speaking Canadians in other provinces. This is mostly Quebec migrants and their offspring who have moved to other Canadian provinces over the years. It also includes children of certain upper-middle-class English-Canadian families who have had access to the sort of resources to get their children a high-quality French education at a young age. But in general, it is worth remembering that most people only become fluent in a language that they have some day-to-day -day need for. If you do not come from a situation where French is an active part of the culture of your day-to-day -day life, it is unlikely that you will become fluent in French. This becomes very clear when we look at the rates of French fluency in provinces other than Quebec. After Quebec, the largest number of French-speaking Canadians can be found in New Brunswick, which is a small province of about 700,000 people that borders Quebec. It has a large French-Canadian population for historic reasons and a bilingualism rate of 33.9%. But let's look at some of the bigger provinces, which are the product of very different history and geography. In Ontario, the French-English bilingualism rate is 11.6%. In my province of British Columbia, the rate is 6.8%. And in Alberta, the rate is 6.6%. So as you can see, when we are talking about French-speaking Canadians outside of Quebec, we are talking about a very small community of people. And also, remember that these statistics are entirely self-reported. I mean, I'm sure you know that not everybody that claims to be able to speak a second language actually can. The small communities of French-speaking Canadians outside of Quebec, however, are savvy enough to know a good thing when they see it. They know that they will continue to enjoy a great deal of power and influence in Canada, so long as the country continues to uphold this whole bilingualism scheme. This is why they naturally get very defensive when politicians like Premier Ford argue for cuts to bilingualism in the name of money or numbers.
More than 5,000 demonstrators flooding the streets of Ottawa, angry at the Ford government cutting French language services in Ontario, including a long proposed French language university. Feeling their distinct way of life is under attack. Uh, but, you know, I mean, I do not want to suggest that these people are completely cynical. They probably do genuinely believe that bilingualism is an important part of Canadian culture and that it is morally right for bilingual people to hold all of these top government jobs. But the fact is, when you have an unequal distribution of power in a society that favors one group of people over another, the favored group of people will inevitably come up with a theory to rationalize their own privilege. In Canada's case, this theory takes the form of a patriotic fable that Canada is like at its essence, at its core, a marriage between French and English people. This is sometimes called the two founding nations theory. And they push it through all sorts of government propaganda and traditions. For instance, on the Canadian coat of arms, you see that they have the English flag and the French flag, the two founding nations. And then like symbolic jobs, like the governor general always rotate between French Canadians and English Canadians. Now in the 18th century, when Canada was just a small chunk of land in Eastern North America, comprising a few English and French colonial settlements, yes, you could argue that the two founding nations theory made some sense, but certainly it makes a lot less sense these days when Canada has grown into this enormous country with all these new provinces, most of which have no history of French colonialism at all. And of course today Canada is this very multicultural country with people from all over the world. For instance, the number of Canadians who do not speak French or English as their first language now totals 7.7 .7 million people or 22.3% of the national population. That is already higher than the 7.4 million Canadians who speak French as their first language. And unless the French Canadians really start breeding up a storm, they are just gonna continue to be a smaller and smaller minority. In fact, I would say that one of the great ticking time bombs is just how undemocratic this reality is gonna make Canada in the future. What's gonna happen, in fact, what's already happening, is that you're gonna have this very big, diverse country in which power is concentrated in the hands of a smaller and smaller linguistic elite with higher and higher barriers to entry. I mean, the ironic thing is that this is exactly the same situation that the French Canadians were protesting way back when. The idea of a society stratified by language in which a privileged group at the top uses their control of the state to discriminate against everyone not like them. So, am I right or wrong about this? I want you guys to let me know in the comments. And let me know if this situation in Canada reminds you of a situation anywhere else in the world. All right, so now let us lighten the mood by doing some viewer mail. Today's mail comes from my friend Darius, or Doris. He is from Bosnia and Herzegovina, so he has given me a couple of interesting things. He has given me this cool little wooden pyramid, which he says is based on a pyramid-shaped mountain that is quite popular and can be entered. People make jokes about the Bosnian pharaohs, he says. That's pretty cool. He has also given me two Bosnian tourism magazines, a CD of traditional Bosnian music. He got me this little purse that has a, the mascot from the 1984 Sarajevo uh, Olympic Games. It was an Olympics that took place in the year I was born, so that's pretty cool. And then, of course, we've got some traditional Bosnian snacks. We have these things here called Gold Flip which is a peanut flavored snack. It actually reminds me a bit of, I think, a snack that one of my other viewers gave me once, maybe from Israel. And then we got these things here, which are called the Rahat Lokum, which is a walnut flavored cookie, which he says is the most traditional food of all. Well, thank you so much, Darius. I hope I'm saying your name right. This was some really cool stuff. Bosnia is a country I would very much like to visit someday. I guess it's a little bit ironic that I was opening some mail from Bosnia in a video all about, you know, internal tensions within a country. But you know, it does show that even a country like Canada that really likes to present itself as the country that has everything figured out, we don't. I'll see you all next week.